First, I'll read from the ESV 11.12. Um, well, let me do the King James one more time so you get it. Ephraim compasseth me about with lies in the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. Judah yet ruleth with God. That's very important because in the future when Jesus Christ comes back, he is the line of the tribe of Judah. So Judah yet ruleth with God. Very important to get that. ESV, Hosea chapter 11, verse 12. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies in the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah still walks with God and is faithful to the Holy One. They take out saints. Hmm, that's interesting. What about the message? Um, these things are so confusing, it's hard to get. Ephraim tells lies right and left. Not a word of Israel can be trusted. Judah, meanwhile, is no better, addicted to cheap gods. Huh? Well, that made it clear. Judah yet rules with God in the King James. Here it says, uh, Judah, meanwhile, is no better addicted to cheap gods. Sure. How about the NIV? Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, Israel with deceit, and Judah is unruly against God, even against the faithful Holy One. Hmm. Interesting. So you have the NIV basically attacking the Jewish people. Judah in particular, which is where Jesus Christ returns from, the tribe of the line or line of the tribe of Judah. Little subtle attack in the NIV attacking the Lord Jesus Christ. Nice uh, version there. Well let's get back to the study. Zechariah chapter 14 verse 5. Zechariah 14, verse 5. It says here, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Okay, again, I believe a reference to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now we're going to go to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27 verse 50 through 53. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So you see there, saints were sleeping. The Old Testament saints, they couldn't go to heaven when they died because Jesus had not died on the cross yet. So they only had their sins were paid for in terms of why I should say that they were covered, but they weren't paid for. Okay, they had the animal sacrifice system and whatever else. So they were covered in a sense there, but they were not taken away until Jesus died on the cross. So the first part of the resurrection is happening there. Very interesting. But you see again, Old Testament saved people are called saints. Next go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Okay, again, it's talking about Saul there before he becomes Paul, and he is attacking the saints living at Jerusalem. Saved people living on the earth. Jump down to verse 32, Acts 9, 32. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. Okay. And uh, you know, again, I'm just looking at the list here. I was trying to think if this was the one, or you know, but it, you know, again, it's just you know, the NIV says it that in this verse it says the Lord's people instead of the saints. The ESV actually says the saints. And uh, the message says the believers. 
Again, why take out the word saints? It just doesn't make any sense. But let's go to the next one. Acts chapter 9, verse 40 through 41. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. He's calling saved people in and they're called saints. Okay, he's not calling for a patron saint to help raise her from the dead because she's already been raised from the dead. So again, problem for Catholic doctrine. Acts chapter 26, verse 9 through 11. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Paul's talking about what happened before he got saved. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. Hmm. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So you can put saints in prison, you can execute them, and you can compel them to blaspheme. Sounds kind of contrary to what the Catholic Church teaches about saints. Hmm. Interesting. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians in Rome. Not Roman Catholics, but Christians in Rome. All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 27. Romans chapter 8, verse 27. And he that searcheth the mind, or excuse me, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Wait a second. The Spirit makes intercession for the saints? I thought the saints are supposed to make intercession for the Christians. Uh-uh. You see how Scripture contradicts this nonsense over here, this Catholic, you know, patron saints, the list of patron saints. Get the app for your iPhone. Yeah. Romans 12, verse 13. Romans 12, 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Huh? Saints have necessity? Well, yeah. <laughs> if you understand Christians, yeah. And you distribute to the need of those saints. Not patron saints in heaven. Romans chapter 15, verse 24. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia, Achaia excuse me, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem." It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this, and have sealed to, you, to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Okay. Where am I reading to here? 33. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with you by the will of God and may uh, with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So Paul, again, is writing and he's saying, I'm going to go over to the saints there. I'm going to go up to the saints, the poor saints in Jerusalem, and I'm going to go to the saints here. I'm going to go to the saints there. They are living Christians. Living, born-again Christians are saints. Romans chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. 
I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sencrea, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succourer of many and of myself also. She was a great servant. She was a helper. She ministered to people. And he said, receive her as becometh saints. He had to remind them, hey, you guys are saints, and you should receive her the way that a saint should do this thing. Act like saints. You're a saint, act like one. That's what Paul was saying. Romans chapter 16, verse 15. Salute Philologus and Julia Nerus, Nerus and his sister Olympus and all the saints which are with them. Again, save people. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Second Corinthians 1, 1. Oh, excuse me. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Tim Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all which are in all Achaia. Achaia. I'll get it out yet. You know, again, saints, living saints, living on the earth. 2 Corinthians 8, 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superf superfluous for me to write to you. Ministering to the saints. I thought the saints in heaven, the patron saints, are there to minister to you. No. No, not, uh, not according to the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves. Did I have this right? Let them they're not wise. Oh, I'm sorry. I went two pages were sticking together. 9 verse 12. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 12. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. What is the want of the saints? If they're these holy demigods up in heaven. It doesn't work. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 13. Next time the word saints appears, all the saints salute you. Paul is writing and he's saying to the people in Corinth, he's saying, hey, all the people that are, all the saved Christians that are here with me, the saints salute you. Not people that are up in heaven. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Saints in Ephesus. Jump down to verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may be, give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his, his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Okay. His inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. There it's clarified. The saints are those who believe. Not some magical group of people that have gone through the four steps of canonization. That's not there. Okay, next let's go to Ephesians 2, verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Okay, I am a fellow citizen with the saints. And you are too if you are saved. Ephesians 3, verse 18. Eight, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. 
Paul was the least of all saints? Uh, I, I don't think so. You know? I mean, how many uh, Catholic Bible buildings? Like St. Paul's Cathedral and Paul this and the, the Holy Apostle Paul, the Apostles Peter and Paul and all this other stuff. He said he's the least, less, less than the least of all saints. Huh? What's he talking about? He's talking about Christians. And that's the right attitude to have, by the way. Be the chiefest of sinners. Okay? Um, where are we at here? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be fulfilled with all the fullness of God. Okay, so he's talking about comprehension for saints that are on the earth. You're not going to need to know all that stuff when you actually get up there to be with God. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 15. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So, you know, it's this thing of, you know, being, reaching that perfection of the knowledge of Christ, that's never going to happen here on the earth. All right, that's going to happen at the rapture when we go to be with Jesus Christ. But again, you see the thing there of the saints are Christians that are supposed to live right. And they can, they can, be, they can blaspheme, they can falter and sin and do all sorts of things. Right? This is not some kind of a, you live this holy life and then later on after death you become a saint. That's not how this thing works. That is not, not a teaching of Scripture. Ephesians 5 verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. So if there's a warning there, don't let this be named among you as becometh saints. Do you think maybe it goes on sometimes? Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. See, again, it's just like this. All the teachings here just do not line up over there with this patron saint thing. But let's continue. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. I'm trying to get through these things here. A lot of references to look up. Ephesians 6, 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Again, how do you reconcile this thing if you're a Roman Catholic? Supplication made for the saints. Not to the saints. For all saints. Get a hold of that thing. Philippians 1, verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Pesky living saints yet again. Philippians 4, verse 22. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's, Caesar's household. We read that earlier, you know, going through those things. So you see it again there, living saints. Okay, Colossians 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. Speaking of saved Christians on the earth. Jump down to verse 12 there in Colossians chapter 1. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Okay? You're going to have the inheritance there when you get to heaven. All right? Important to get that. 
Colossians 1, verse 25 through 26. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now but now is made manifest to his saints. Again, that's one of the reasons a lot of these lost people like Catholics and things, they don't understand the gospel because why? It's not revealed to them. It's revealed to the saints, people like me, other saved brethren on YouTube. And we go out there and we have the ministry of reconciliation committed to us. And so we commit the gospel to the lost world and say, okay, this is how you get saved. After you get saved, yeah, then all this stuff will make sense. See, trying to understand the Bible, trying to understand all aspects of Christianity, real Christianity, before you get saved, um, that doesn't work. It's like a blind man going down to the uh, local hardware store and saying, I want to pick out all the collars for the walls in my house. And before his eyesight is restored. Well, that wouldn't make much sense. Okay? Restore your eyesight. Get your eyesight, you know, open your eyes. Like I talked about in my one sermon. When your eyes are opened, now you can see. Then things will make sense. Continuing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Talked about that earlier. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels... In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Okay, now I believe that when Christians come back, we are likened to angels. All right. That's, you know, and there's a big study on that. I can't get into all that right now. But you see this thing there of Jesus Christ comes back with ten thousands of his saints. He comes back with the angels and he's glorified in his saints. Okay, why? Because we rule and reign with Christ for that thousand year period. Okay. First Timothy chapter five. First Timothy chapter five, verse nine through ten. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Um, it'd be kind of gross if she was washing the feet of Catholic saints because they have to be dead for five years before they can become saints. So you're, you probably don't want to go wash the, the feet of a corpse that's been dead for five years. Philemon chapter 1. Philemon chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by the brother. Again, speaking about living saints on the earth. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Again, if we're talking saints, our patron saints in heaven that you pray to, how can you minister to them? Their job is to minister to you. See, it doesn't work out. Saints in your Bible are living saved people or dead saved people that are in heaven waiting to come back. All right? Get a hold of that thing. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 verse 24. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. Living saints on the earth. Jude 1 3. Jude 
Jude chapter 1 verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints here on earth. The saints in heaven don't need the, the gospel delivered to them. Okay, It's a reference to save people on the earth. Look at uh, verse 14 through 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all, all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have uh, ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So you see that thing there, that prophecy again of the ten thousands of his saints coming with Jesus Christ to judge the earth, to rule and reign with Christ, and to glorify him through that millennial kingdom. That's what you see there. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Finally, we made it to the last book of the Bible. <laughs> Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. He say, oh, look, there, patron saints, patron saints. No, 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 no. These are the prayers of saints, the people that are on the earth. Okay. So that's what's going on there. These are not some kind of magical prayers that they, there's, and you know, and they get all this thing and they swing the little thing with the smoke coming out of it and all that stuff. Like that stuff is just all paganism. All right. What's going on here is those people that are on the earth, the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble, they are praying to God and those prayers are coming up in the form of these, you know, like odors, they're like sacrifices, you know, like a sweet smelling savor kind of a thing. That's what's going on there. These are not special prayers of, of the, the lower case G gods, saints that are in heaven and all that. That's nonsense. Look at Rome, or Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound um, okay, that's where I'm reading to. I wasn't sure where I was going to read to. But you see there again the thing of the saints, the people that are alive in that time of Jacob's trouble, their prayers, they're praying to God saying, you know, please stop this, please help us, whatever else. God hears those prayers and he is pouring out his vengeance upon the lost as a result. That's all that's going on there. This is not some kind of proof text for these patron saints in heaven that the Catholic Church teaches. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So you see that thing there again of saints, and they're linked right in with prophets there. It's not some special group of, you know, people that you pray to. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. So in the time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to have to have patience and faith. Why? He that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. See, it's a different setup there. It's not that you're believing in somebody else other than Jesus Christ. No, there's still the faith of Jesus Christ. But now there's a new aspect to salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's how you know the body of Christ is not going to be here for that time. 
That new aspect of salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble is you can't take that mark, which means there's no shopping. There's no going for food. There's no job. There's no bank account. There's no insurance. There's no nothing. You're going to have to survive in that time. That's why you're going to be praying like crazy. All right? If you're saved today, you're not going to go into that time. If you're still lost, when the rapture happens, you will go into that time. That's why I'm trying to make these sermons, trying to tell you to get saved. But let's continue. Next, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The commandment of God, the big one then, is going to be don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. So you have to have faith and that work there of not taking the mark. You know, And I don't mean works as in good little nice little deeds and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. People take my words and twist them all the time. I'm not talking about that. Read the context of what's going on here. All right? Again, talked about it in other studies. I'm not going to cover it again here. Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 through 3. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. There you see it again. It's interesting because, let me check here my wife's list that she wrote out for me. I think this is one of the ones where they change most of the ones. Uh, Revelation. Yeah. The uh, newest NIV, the message, and the ESV all say the king of the nations. They don't say king of saints. King of the nations. Well, that's really helpful. Next, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 16, verse 4. It says here, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of, of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. So, again, Catholic standard is a saint has to be dead for five years before they can go through the four steps. How then can you shed the blood of a saint? See, it just doesn't work. Uh, let's go next to Revelation chapter 17, verses 3 through 6. It says here, So he carried me away in the, in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-collared scarlet beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Hmm. Interesting there. And you say, well, who's this describing? Roman Catholicism. So it's kind of funny that they're talking about, you know, the saints and stuff. And they bring out these lists of these patron saints. All the saints, the saints, the saints. We just canonized some more saints. All the saints, the saints. And the Lord looks down at them and says, actually, no, you're, you've killed the saints. You don't have saints in you. You're killing them. Hmm. Very interesting. Revelation chapter 18, verse 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Okay. Revelation chapter 18 is where Mystery Babylon, the Roman Catholic system, is destroyed. Can't wait for that day. 
Revelation chapter 19. Just a couple more here and then we're done. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was arrayed that she should be arrayed, or to her was granted, excuse me, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. The bride of Christ is made up of saints. Saved, born again Christians. Not magical deities that have power to help your toothache. All right, the final one. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 through 9. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So at that point in time, the beloved city, Jerusalem, where Jesus Christ rules and reigns, is going to also have the camp of the saints round about it. Okay, Those Christians that have gone and that have been saved, ruling and reigning with Christ for the thousand years, that right there is the last reference in the King James Bible to the word saints. So, what have we learned? <laughs> Hopefully you learned something from this. And that is, every single reference in the King James Bible, it's most of the time is referring to living, saved people. They are saints, according to the Word of God. All right? When it refers to people that are in heaven, it's people that were saved on the earth. And they're in heaven now. They were saints on the earth. They're saints in heaven. It's not that they were religious people on the earth, and now they became canonized saints in heaven. And again, what right do sinful men have to be able to determine, I am going to officially make you a saint through our little process of canonization and all this other stuff? It's ridiculous. You know, and these people that are professing or that are saints and stuff like this, they're not even Christians, you know? I mean, Pope John Paul II, you know, talked about evolution and things that he believed in evolution theory, among many other things. You know, I remember a picture of him dedicating a black Madonna, you know, a black Mary. And he's a Christian. He's an official saint, you know. What a bunch of nonsense. But, uh, I mean, again, I didn't really cover it a whole lot in this thing. I did, I did give, uh, you know some of these references, but uh, I mean, it's just insane how that these new versions, I mean, NIV, they put in the Lord's people instead of saints. Uh, they'll say God's holy people. You know, it just goes down through here. Uh, the message, um, a family of Christians, the churches, poor Christians, believers, you know, it goes down, his followers, um, your brothers and sisters, other believers. I mean, it's just so absurd, these things, you know, his loyally committed ones. I mean, that's a lot easier than saying saints, you know. You see, where's that at? Proverbs chapter 2, verse 8 in the message. His loyally committed ones. Yeah, you know, don't you just love how they clear up the archaic word saints? You know, just incredible. But, oh, I like this one too. Psalm 52, verse 9, the message says, your faithful friends. There you go. That's a good one. You know, and uh, in um, Job 5, 1 and Job 15, 15, the message says the holy angels instead of the saints. Isn't that something? So, what do you need to do to become a saint? Well, according to the King James Bible, it is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you get saved, you become a saint. When God saves you. And you say, how does God save me? By doing salvation God's way. By coming to Him as a sinner. Repentance toward God. Understanding you can't save yourself. Understanding I can't come to God in my pride and tell Him I'm going to live my life my way. You're not going to tell me what to do. You come to God broken. You come to God and say, I'll do whatever you want me to do. My life is your life. 
I don't care what the truth is. Uh, I'll, you know, how, how divisive, how militant or whatever, I'm going to live by the truth. <coughs> I'm going to do that. Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross once to pay for your sins, excluding the Mass. The Mass isn't even in the Bible. That whole teaching is satanic. It's, it's occultic. Drinking flesh, eating, or drinking blood, eating flesh, you know, and saying it is the literal, you know, and stuff like this. It was always symbolic in the Bible. Again, I covered that in my other study. All right. Um, you need to get saved. If you don't know Jesus Christ personally as your Savior, apart from religion, apart from church buildings, apart from the Mass, apart from Catholicism, whatever else, you need to know Jesus Christ. This is the most important thing that you have before you. And if you're trying to pray to patron saints up in heaven, let me tell you, you have been deceived, majorly deceived. Okay, This stuff here is pagan superstition. This has no basis in Scripture. In Scripture, saints are living people. And you say, well then, uh, who can be my mediator? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We'll go there yet. One more verse. I'll read for you here. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Not Mary, not your favorite patron saint, Jesus Christ. And that's it. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, that uh, we have a standard, a perfect standard in the King James Bible, and that we don't have to rely on the traditions of men, the ever-changing traditions of men. I just thank you, Lord, that um, we can be saints here on the earth and in eternity. And we don't need to go through some kind of a, a special canonization process that takes years and years and years to do. We don't need to go through that. We can become saints just by your blood washing away our sins. And Lord, I do pray for those out there that are saved, that are definitely Christians, that they would start to act like saints. Uh, that they would not uh, have filthiness and foolish talking in their speech and that they would clean up their mouth and clean up their life and, and get themselves focused on the work that they need to do for you, uh, the purpose that you've saved them, Lord. And I just uh, pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That is going to be it for this week, for this study. I'm going to be coming out with some more studies um, exposing some of the false doctrines of Catholicism. Um, Going to be talking about uh, Catholic child pornography. That ought to make me some more friends. And I'm also going to be talking about Mary, who the real Mary is of Catholicism. Um, and I'm going to be showing you some pretty interesting things. Not just, uh, you know, from the Bible and things like that, but I'm actually going to be showing you some things from Catholicism. Uh, showing that their real Mary uh, is actually... Um, Semiramis, um, the queen of hell. Okay, I'm going to be showing you that here. I don't, probably not next week, maybe a week after that. Not sure yet. Um, going to have a very, very busy week here coming up. Um, might try to have something ready for next Sunday, but I, I can't say for sure. Uh, it's, it's going to be very hectic with relatives coming here and everything else. And I mean, it takes me a long time to put these studies together. So, if you don't see me coming back next week um, with a full-length sermon, I'll try to post something to explain what's going on. But um, I just kind of need to just kind of refocus the ministry a little bit here. And you know, while relatives are here and stuff like that, it's you know just going to be kind of a little bit of a vacation time. I don't do that very often, but um, so that's going to be it. Got a lot of work to do right now, so I'm going to cut this sermon short here, but I do thank you very much for, for um, your prayers. Uh, really, as we've been doing, my wife and I have been doing some studies on this thing of Catholicism, uh, I can tell when I'm really hitting Satan where he doesn't want to get hit, 
because the attacks just get really, really strong. And I mean, uh, sickness and just depression and just the spiritual oppression is incredible when I've been doing the studies on Catholicism. I mean, it's just unreal. Uh, it's a lot easier to just talk about just regular subjects. I mean, you start kicking the devil uh, where it hurts him, he kicks back. So please, please keep us in your prayers over these next few weeks as I get some more studies done. And uh, just really uh, thank you to everybody that's been donating and things too. That's, that's a, um, keeps us going, uh, keeps us in, in this work. So uh, I guess that's going to be it. Lights are flickering a little bit here, but uh, I guess the devil heard his name mentioned and he doesn't like it being mentioned. Especially when I'm kicking his uh, favorite church, Catholicism. But uh, by God's grace, we will continue to do so. So that is it. Thank you very much for watching. And we will see you in either a week or two weeks. I'm not sure yet. So please keep us in your prayers.